The Dharma is fast and subtle. The Dharma is fast and subtle. We now have a chance to see this. We now have a chance to see this. Study this and practice this. Study this and practice this. May we realize this truth. May we realize this true <clears throat> Well, we're not hearing you. Aha. Aha. Okay. Um, bef before we get started here, is everybody in the Zendo there seeing and hearing okay? Yes. Great. All right. Everybody in the Zoom room seeing and hearing okay? I see nodding. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good morning to you. It is wonderful. Um, it is wonderful for me to be here. I am very grateful to be asked back. And um, I uh, did a little Google weather search before Zazen and the, um, the internet gods assure me that in Omaha, Nebraska, it is 72 degrees and sunny and or partly cloudy today. Is that in keeping with your experience? It's yes. very humid, very humid. <laughs> ah, and very, yeah, it's humid here too. I don't know exactly how many miles north of you I am, but I'm almost directly north of you here in the Twin Cities. And it's, yeah, it's sticky enough today to count as sticky, I think. Um, so uh, if, if any of you, um, uh, tune in for um, Minnesota Zen Meditation Center Sunday talks. And I don't imagine that you would because I think our time schedule uh, is close enough to one another that you wouldn't be able to do both. But um, what I'm going to talk about today, um, the first little bit of um, I talked about last Sunday at, uh, at Minnesota Zen Center. So that's just kind of me buying myself a little insurance for uh, being willing to repeat myself a little bit. Um, but before I launch into that, um, I kind of want to just uh, call to a, our collective attention the fact that it's June. Uh, it is June 12th. It's a Sunday. Um, by most standards, it's a beautiful day. And um, not only have we chosen to not be, at least right now, at the beach uh, or in the park or having a picnic, we've chosen to be inside. Uh, furthermore, we've chosen, <laughs> at least for the last half an hour, uh, to park ourselves very squarely in front of a wall and stare at it, <laughs> which is objectively speaking a rather odd choice. And um, this is, I guess, a rhetorical question for you to just perhaps um, let wander through you. Um, I'm fascinated by why we've chosen to do that. I just think it's kind of nice to pull back all the way sometimes and go, it's interesting that I have made the decision this morning to do what I have chosen to do. It's a relatively unconventional decision all of us have made. And I'm not talking about Zen Buddhism in particular. I'm talking about spiritual practice and spiritual aspiration in general. Um, it is my experience on a personal level that I am motivated, um, kind of my human DNA motivates me to practice through great suffering. And it, uh, in my experience seems right to say that my spiritual DNA uh, motivates me to practice through great longing. And our Buddhist tradition um, addresses both of those things in its own particular way. It has its own words uh, for the human DNA 
and the suffering that the human DNA gives rise to. We have words like dukkha that explain what suffering feels like when it pushes us from the back. And what longing, uh, what the possibility of awakening nature, bodhicitta, words like that describe that part of us that recognizes that there is something, another possibility, something more, another way, another part, perhaps to us or to life. So I just want to start by acknowledging we're swimming in the very same water today. Um, some of you, I'm sure, are longtime uh, practitioners who would self-identify as Zen Buddhist. Some of you perhaps are brand new. Regardless of how we self-identify, regardless of the kind of minutia of our motivations for being here today, whether we're live in person or whether we're watching this recording later, listening to this recording late, later, I just encourage you to be intimate with that question. Um, you're obviously asking questions. You're obviously willing to investigate the interior landscape, the spiritual part of your being. And that's a extraordinary thing. It's a deeply extraordinary thing. Um, so the fact we start together by holding hands in that way, having that in common in that way, uh, creates in me an intimacy and a lot of gratitude. There's a lot of mystery in that too, but a lot of gratitude and a lot of intimacy. So I thank you. I thank you for making the decision that you made today. Um, and at some point when I'm done talking, maybe we can all go out into the humidity and <laughs> catch up with our friends who are at the beach already. So um, I will shift gears here. Uh, um, I am going to start um, this. Um, the tone here is it's going to get a little challenging to start with, um, and then it will change a little bit. But I would I would like to start um, this morning with uh, three things. I'd like to start with a statistic. Um, followed by an invitation for all of us, and then finally a nice Zen story to get us to get us kind of rolling. So this is the part that I delivered last week, um, and is still sadly very relevant. To start with, a statistic, uh, which I'm quoting from the Washington Post, which is now about ten days old. Uh, there have been over two hundred mass shootings thus far in the year 2022 in the country of the United States. Mass shootings have averaged more than one per day this calendar year. Not a single week in 2022 has thus far passed without at least four mass shootings. Um, in the past week, since I delivered that information at Zen Center, there have been, I think, three more, to my knowledge. So the second thing um, is an invitation. I hope this feels like a Buddhist invitation uh, because this is a Buddhist setting. But my invitation to you and my invitation to myself, my invitation to all of us, please change your life. It is the only life you can change. So in the external world, when we go out, vote, of course, you get to vote with your vote. You get to vote with your voice. You get to vote with your actions and your lifestyle. You get to vote with your dollars. I challenge all of us collectively that if we say something matters to us, perhaps something like nonviolence, then we should act like it. We should live like it. We should use our influence to make the difference that we can. So that feels very Buddhist to me. Perhaps not the word vote, but perhaps the focus on knowing where my agency lies and being willing to use that agency. Um, in your external life, if your external life, the way that you live relationally, the way you spend your money, um, the job that you have, the place that you live, I don't know what the details show up as, but if our external lives are not in alignment with our values, Buddhism encourages us to change our external life. 
we call that right speech, right action, and right livelihood, right? But because this is Zen and because this is Buddhism, the majority of our focus, as we all know, is internal, right? I do go out into the world and I do get to vote with my dollars and I do get to vote with my voice. I get to say things, I get to speak up. I get to change the places that I shop. I get to change the ways that I interact in the outside world, of course I do. It's my responsibility to do that. But all of us know probably enough about Buddhism to know that the focus is internal. Our practice is focused internally for the most part because we acknowledge together that the roots of suffering are internal, the roots of violence are internal, and therefore the roots of freedom and nonviolence are also internal. And the first noble truth says, and I'm going to paraphrase, that all of us are regularly shot at, literally and or metaphorically. And the first noble truth also reminds us, especially when we look at the roots of dukkha, that all of us regularly shoot. So since mine is the only life that I can change fully, directly, I am required to ask myself, what are my weapons? When the great big hurt comes to me, and it does, and it will again, when the great big hurt comes to me, what weapons do I turn to? And how do I use them? And who do I use them on? Myself? Others? Both. I must be committed, as we all must, if we're Zen practitioners, to seeing our own weapons, to seeing them, to recognizing them, to understanding which ones we turn to, why we turn to them, who we use them against. And we also are responsible for knowing what gives rise to wanting to use them the roots of suffering we must become aware of and we must understand and we must legislate our own inner hatred, judgment, criticism, pain, greed, the things that give rise, right? They give rise to our impulse, our impulse to violence. One of the advantages I think we have in this beautiful tradition is how plainly the tradition names these things as suffering. Your greed is suffering, Busho. Your anger is suffering, Busho. Your confusion, your delusion, that's just suffering. I'm so grateful that the tradition is so clear about what suffering needs. It's common sense. Every human should know it. But I love that our tradition is so clear about it. Suffering needs attention. It just needs attention. It needs to be cared for. It's a voice of pain, it wants to be heard, it wants to be understood. That's all. We call these things compassion and wisdom to be cared for and understood, right? So if my internal life and if your internal life, if our internal lives are not in alignment with our values, we must change our internal life. I believe deeply in the principle of nonviolence. And as somebody who's been sitting Zazen for 30 years, I see lots and lots and lots and lots of violence, of course, in the outside world. Everybody knows that. But I see lots of it internally, in large ways, in obvious ways, and in subtle ways. Isn't it beautiful that we did choose to do what we did today, to come together, to sit still, to bear witness and go, oh, there you are. There's the part of me still hurting, still confused, still angry, still frustrated, not getting its needs met. It's been ignored, it's been stepped on, I've turned away from it, I've repressed it, I've suppressed it, I've denied it, I've judged it, I've blamed it. Here's a chance for me to just sit with it and go, I'm sorry, I didn't see. But you're calling out to me and I will listen. And you want someone to sit with you and so I will. And you wanna know what is true and what is not. And so I will do my best. Compassion and wisdom. What a simple practice we have. 
Okay. So the third thing, this is a little bit of a tonal shift. So <sighs> third thing is our is our little Zen story for the day, right? Uh, our little Zen story for today. So uh, this morning's little Zen story is an actual official one. Dun, 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 dun. A nice koan, a nice koan for all of us. From because we're Soto folks here today. This is our this is our uh, right down the boulevard koan collection, the book of serenity, case number twelve. Some of you know this, some of you don't. It doesn't matter. Our little koan this morning reads as following. Uh, reads as following. The the title they usually give it is Daizang planting the fields, but it depends on what translation of the book of serenity you're looking at. Right, case twelve is sometimes uh, titled other things. So. Daizong. Daizong asks Zuishan, where do you come from? And Zuishan said, oh, I'm coming from the south. Daizong says, uh, how is Buddhism in the south these days? And Zuishan says, there's extensive discussion. Daizong says, uh, how can that compare to me here, planting fields and making rice? Zuishan says, what can you do about the world? And finally, Daizong says, well, what do you call the world? At first, it's a little bit of a puzzling interchange between these two rascals. Um, my suggestion to you is look it up, you know, look it up in your library there uh, at, your, uh, at your leisure or, you know, do a search for it later. The Book of Serenity, Case 12. There's actually a lot going on in this koan, um, but for today's for today's purposes, I'm going to concentrate on the first sentence, and I'm going to concentrate on the last sentence. So we have two people who must know each other. Dai Zong is obviously our. I, I think during the course of our little story here, he's kind of held up to be the the master. I suppose I. I I really hesitate using that word. I really don't care for it, but <laughs> the teacher, the the kind of smarty pants, usually in one of these exchanges, one of them is in a little bit of an up position, either because they're actually the teacher or because through the course of the interchange, their understanding is understood to be perhaps further along or something. You kind of get it, right? Yeah. So Dai Zong, I guess, is a little bit the hero of the story. When he asks his buddy, hey, where are you coming from? That's the invitation to, um, I'm gonna try to get a sense of where you're at right now. And so when he gets the response, oh, I'm coming from the South, he's being given an answer that is literal and geographical and external. And so he's getting a sense of where his friend Zuishan is at, right? If we were all hanging out together, you know, later on today in the humidity, um, I say, yeah, well, kind of like, where are you coming from? That's it, obviously an English translation of what might show up very, very differently in Chinese when it was you know, originally written. But I actually like our English translation because it's a very open way of asking kind of where are you at, how are you? It's kind of a version of how are you? Where are you coming from today? And so it's open to a lot of different possible avenues. And the way that we answer that just sort of shows the person we're talking to where our focus is. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. He's learning a little bit about Zuishan's state of consciousness in that moment. It's externally focused and it's pretty literal. But the last line, when he's being challenged a little bit, hey, what are you doing about the world? You're here planting rice. I've been down in the South having extensive discussion, which is a great phrase, extensive discussion about Buddhism. That's hilarious. <laughs> I hope that's hilarious. I mean, we're Zen people, right? So extensive discussion about Buddhism, is, it's, a fun, it's a funny thing to say. What are you doing here about the world with your planting rice? The nature of the question and the reason that this koan is being talked about a lot these days in Zen centers is because the linchpin question, what are you doing about the world? Is a really important one for us. You know, what are you doing about the world? What can you do about the world? It is an important question. It should be an important question. It's why to me it's married with how we started today, looking at statistics about gun violence in our country. 
looking at the state of uh, racial inequity or gender inequity or climate change or, uh, I mean, the list goes on. All of us know the list. Uh, all of us have a news feed. All of us ask in some way, what am I doing about the world? And this has been a tension that has always existed from the very, 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 very inception of Buddhism. There are lots of Pali canon passages in the earliest records of the Buddha's life and teaching that talk about there's a kingdom at war with another kingdom, the Buddha's own tribe. Being at war, what are you going to do? Mr. Nonviolence, are you going to do something? Do you, do you jump in? Do you sit? Do you do both? Do you, what do you do? This is a perennial uh, philosophical and spiritual question. When do we act? When do we not? And as Buddhists, this is an especially pointed one for us because we do understand, according to the Buddhist um, perception of the origin of suffering, that it's internal. So we start internally. When we want to stop the war, we go in, which makes sense. That's a beautiful response. At what point are we called to go out? I'm not here to answer that question. I'm wise enough to not try. But that's kind of the gist of this story. It's one way of understanding the gist of the story is extensive discussion about Buddhism versus planting rice. Which of those is doing something about the world? And so the master's response to, well, wait, what do you call the world? Is, ugh, there's the punch. You know, these koans oftentimes kind of land with sort of like one last comment that throws everything on its head and makes you go, oh, okay, hold on a minute, hold on a minute, hold on a minute. What do I call the world? What do you call the world? Sounds like a trippy response. It sounds almost kind of half smart alecky to me. It's probably why I like this story so much. I have a little smart alecky streak, streak in me. I think a lot of Zen folks do. Zen is, you know, occasionally a little smart alecky, <laughs> right? <laughs> We're kind of like, yeah, Buddhism with jokes. Just keep it a little eh, edgy. But it's also uh, a brilliantly sophisticated question. It is a brilliantly sophisticated question. What do you call the world? Let's talk about this. That sounds like it might even be evasive. And my sense, my response today is that it's not evasive at all. It's, okay, we want to talk about this. Let's talk about what we're doing for the world. But let's go all the way down and let's define our terms. What are we going to call the world? How can I help a world that I see as separate from myself? It might be more beneficial for me to understand. It might be more beneficial for me to deeply understand that the world is not something out there. And if I consider the way that we are all constantly, every instant, making the world, then every simple, ordinary action, choosing to go to Nebraska Zen Center and wall gaze for 30 minutes, is doing something about the world. As is your decision an hour from now to stop by the coffee shop on the way home and get a iced cold brew because it's that kind of day or call and talk to your sister-in-law who you haven't talked to or take a nap on the couch or adopt a cat or make a phone call. I don't know. Our starting point, it is really important to understand our starting point has to acknowledge the radical participatory, hopelessly suffused interconnected, we use the term interconnected in Buddhism, which kind of almost goes far enough. But to me, I like suffusion, that we suffuse one another because interconnected can still sometimes feel like object A and object B are connected. It doesn't, it's a good word. I'm not arguing with the word, but you know, we just got through chanting the Heart Sutra, which just says, don't think there are separate objects that interact. Can you sort of see how the chant this morning, the Heart Sutra leads right into this? What do you call the world? How can you help a world that you see as separate from yourself? So, um, 
if I out of nowhere am sitting in a Zendo like um, if I'm sitting in a, a Zendo like Nebraska sensor and out of nowhere I reach over and just poke my friend there. <laughs> you don't actually have to do this. <laughs> I drink tea. Poke. I say, hey, ouch, stop poking me. Pusho, that's what they would say, right? They're unlikely to say, hey, Pusho, stop poking the upper left quadrant of my left shoulder. They're just unlikely to say that. Even though I'm only poking the upper left quadrant of their left shoulder. They're unlikely to say that. They're more likely to say, stop poking me. You see it? I poked them. I also just poked that one little part of them, I know. But do you see how fuzzy that gets, how quickly? What do you do about the world? When the Buddha reached down and touched the earth to pass the third temptation, we say he touched the earth. In fact, there's a complicated Sanskrit word that I will not try to pronounce that actually translates as earth touching gesture or earth touching mudra. If you know, if you know Buddhist iconography, you know, there are lots and lots of images and pictures and statues of the Buddha touching the earth. It's an incredibly important moment in the Buddhist myth, right? The myth of the, the life of the Buddha is him reaching down and touching the earth. We don't say he touched a little spot of ground about the size of a quarter underneath his right knee, <laughs> right? Which is funny because he did touch a little spot of ground about the size of a quarter beneath his right knee. Just like I'm poking my friend in the upper left. Do you sort of see it? So in any given moment, I can ask you, what are you doing about the world? But in that moment, I must be meaning something specific. I just got through reading an article about gun violence. What are you doing about the world? Oh, I bet he's asking me what I'm doing about gun violence what I'm doing about the seeds of violence within me. What I'm, have I called my congressperson? Am I voting? Am I purchasing uh, you know, products from companies that I know support? Da, 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 da. What, what's going on? Why is he asking me? Oh, he just got through reading an article about climate change. Oh, he was just picking up his niece and nephew from the airport and realizing they both hadn't had COVID shots. Da, 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 da. Do you kind of get it? What are you doing about the world? It can mean any number of different things. I wanna help the world is a really beautiful thing to say. It is a lovely thing to say. I suspect every single one of us here today, every one of us listening to the recording, every one of us who's drawn to any kind of spiritual practice would have no problem saying, I wanna help the world. I wanna help. It's a noble thing to say. Yeah, you're not gonna get a lot of pushback if you say, I want to help the world. But asking yourself what that actually means for you is perhaps even a lovelier, perhaps even a more noble thing. I'm offering that because this is a Zen community and asking ourselves, what's underneath that? What does that really mean? How close can I get to the spirit of that? Can I feel that in my body? Feels like a very Zen way of understanding things. As, as most of you, I'm sure know, we don't do a lot of speculative abstract. What's really underneath that? Of course I wanna help the world. I believe you all do too. What does that actually mean? What is the world? What part of me wants to help? What does help look like? So what I would, posit this morning is that as Zen practitioners, we would kind of maybe intuitively start with knowing that we don't know. I don't know where the line is between what I call me and what I call the world. I'm not sure. What do you call the world? I actually don't know right now the answer to that question. And I have some awareness of what gives rise the, to to the desire in me to help. But I bet there are pockets of that that I don't understand. Kind of like what drove me to be at Zen Center today 
to start with, I know there's some suffering there that motivates me, the great suffering as part of my human DNA that motivates my spiritual aspiration. It's, it hurts and surely this must be changeable. There must be something that I can do. It's what propels Buddha to jump over the palace walls. It's what propels the first noble truth. It's the thing that propels us. There must be more about that that I can learn so that I'm clear about what's motivating me. I discover a spiritual DNA. Oh, there's some part of me that longs, that kind of remembers almost my awakened nature, my Buddha nature, bodhicitta. Oh, there's part of me that seeks the way. Wow, right? So even knowing what motivates me, what drove you here today? What are you doing about the world? It's the same question. Can you sort of see that? It's sort of the same question. And I, th and I do believe we're wise enough as Soto Zen practitioners to start by saying, I don't know all of it. I can give you some good answers. I can start with a lot of stuff. It's all gonna be helpful, but fundamentally there's gonna be a lot about this that I do not know. And don't know mind as you know is prized. It is a beautiful thing in our tradition. We are not afraid of not knowing. That's a big deal. We talk about that a lot in Zen, don't know mind, unknowing, non-thinking, self-emptying. Yep, we talk about it a lot and I'm glad we give it that much airtime. It's a big one because all of our social messages have been the opposite. To know things makes you smart, to be smart makes you good. To not know things makes you dumb, to not know things makes you bad. Now, none of that's true, but sure feels true. <laughs> Especially if we've been told it a few, hundred thousand times, right? So all of us know, don't know is a good place to start. And we all know don't know isn't like in praise of ignorance or anti-intellectual, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about looking so closely that we start going, oh wait, all of this stuff is connected to one another. What am I doing about the world? What do you call the world is an invitation to go all the way down and go, I can only do things about the world, no matter what, stay in bed all day, get up and mow the lawn. Both of those are doing something about the world. I can't not do something about the world. It's impossible, <laughs> right? So looking at the things that we assume are our foregone conclusions is really helpful for us. That tends to be the things that causes the most suffering when we are certain, 100% certain. I'm 100% certain I know what you need. Can you feel how dangerous that statement is. <laughs> I, I do. I can just feel like even saying it makes me laugh. Like, oh, I know what you need. It's like, oh, wow, this is about to go off the rails. That's the point in the movie where everything's just about to get really, really horrible. Because I, you know, being convinced that I know what you need is really dangerous. My country thinking it knows what your country needs. My gender thinking it knows what yours needs. My race thinking it knows what's my religion thing. You can feel it, right? It doesn't matter what variation we pull out of the hat. It's like, wow. Starting instead going, wait, why do I actually want to help? And what does help actually look like is way more helpful for both of us. If I can't feel in me, oh, I have a desire, a really powerful desire right now to control, then I'm going to be a dangerous person. That's going to end up being violent, either subtly or not so subtly. So in the middle of a lake, one wave asked another, what are you doing to help the lake? And the second wave replied, what do you call the lake? I obviously made that up. <laughs> it's the very same thing as the koan, right? One human being and another human being. What are you doing to help the world? What do you call the world? I love that our tradition uses waves on a lake as a metaphor for our separateness and our non-separateness. We use that metaphor of waves on a lake to talk about our interconnectedness, to talk about birth, to talk about death. That same metaphor to talk about the fact, yeah, we're totally separate. I know we're separate. When I do that, you can't feel it. That's true. We are separate, that's true. Two waves are two waves, baby. They're not the same. They are separate. Oh, and also you pull back the camera a little bit and go, oh wait, there's just a lake laking. It's never been anything other than that. 
So two human beings, what are you doing to help the world? What do you call the world? Two, lake, two waves on a lake. Hey, what are you doing to help the lake? What do you call the lake? I can also see the, uh, the other side of this, one wave kind of accosting a second one and saying, stop helping the lake, mind your own business. I mean, it's almost humorous, isn't it? But we can feel that impulse sometimes in ourselves when we see others participating in the world in a way that we find unhelpful, right? Wow. So, I'm getting close here, but before I close, I want to read something from um, Howard Thurman. Some of you may know Howard Thurman. It would be very understandable if you didn't. He's not a Buddhist. He's a Baptist. I think he was a Baptist. I want to say he was a Baptist, but we can all look it up later and find out. Um, Howard Thurman was a, a, a very prominent figure in the civil rights movement, but a quietly prominent. Is that a thing? Quietly prominent? <laughs> he was Martin Luther King Jr.'s spiritual director. That's, he has many claims to fame, so I don't want to reduce it to him being famous via relationship to someone famous because he was deeply influential in his own right as a theologian and a mystic and all sorts of stuff as a spiritual writer. But everybody knows Martin Luther King Jr. And therefore we know he had a spiritual director and Howard Thurman was that person. So um, in uh, 1980, he was giving the commencement speech at uh, Spelman college and he said the following which to me sounds awfully relevant and very buddhist to me he said i can become quiet enough and still enough to hear the sound of the genuine in me i can become quiet enough and still enough to hear the sound of the genuine in you now, if I hear the sound of the genuine in me, and if you hear the sound of the genuine in you, it is possible for me to go down in me and come up in you. So that when I look back at myself through your eyes, having made that pilgrimage, I see in me what you see in me. And the wall that separates and divides will disappear and we'll, we will become one because the sound of the genuine makes the same music. That seems like an amazing thing to say at a college commencement speech. Speaking only for myself when I was 22 years old, I would not have been in any kind of mind frame to receive something that sophisticated and beautiful and advanced. <laughs> That was just me at 22. Some of you were probably way ahead of me. I hope so. Boy, can I feel interconnectedness. And boy, can I feel what, I mean, I could, we, we all could probably translate that into Buddhist terminology and go, that is a deeply Buddhist teaching. When we get quiet and still, we start to know what is, we get closer to what is true. And we realize we can connect at that level. And now separation becomes just something that happens at the top, like the waves and underneath we appreciate non-separateness. Now, what am I gonna do about the world? Being asked from that place feels like an entirely different question to me. What feels dangerous to me is one way of saying to another way of, I think I know what you need. You need to be taller or um, more white cappy there on the top or a little smaller or go a little faster or go a little slower. And can you feel it? based on that kind of understanding, what do I do about the world? To go down to the level of the sound of the genuine, which I think is a beautiful term. I don't know what was in Howard Thurman's heart and I would never guess. It's interesting to me that he didn't say the divine, he didn't say God, I mean, he's a Baptist, you'd expect that would be his language. He didn't say Buddha nature, of course. He didn't say one mind, he didn't say don't know mind. He didn't say, there's a million things he could have said. Instead, he chose terminology that every human can understand, genuine. We all know that's a relationship with what is true, what is deeply true, what is most true. Can you hear the sound of the genuine? I'm like, oh my God, well, that's Zazen. Getting quiet enough and still enough to hear the sound of the genuine in me. My suffering is genuine, folks. It shows up every time I sit. 
And my invitation to awaken compassion to meet that suffering is also genuine. That shows up when I sit. If my zazen isn't that, I don't know what it's good for. I know that Howard Thurman is saying to me that if I go into my own suffering all of the way, that I will find the suffering of others and I'll find love. And Buddha gives us exactly the same teaching. We know that when he says to investigate your suffering, especially in the light of interrelationship, we realize, oh my God, there is just the suffering. It's not yours, Busho. Sure, it's unique to you. But when you go down into your suffering, you're gonna find your neighbors and your friends. This is the deal, it's connective tissue. And so I know that Howard Thurman, and I know that Dai Zhang and Zhui Shan, and I know that the two waves and the like, and I know that the Buddha are all saying, bearing compassionate witness, bearing compassionate witness heals suffering and nothing else does. And that's the world. And that's what I can do about it. And that's the world and that's what I can do about it. Bearing compassionate witness, being willing to be with it and see it and hold it and say, I care and I see you. And to meet suffering with kindness heals suffering and nothing else does. And that's the world. So whether that happens through extensive conversations about Buddhism, or that happens at a peace march, or that happens planting rice, or that happens later on today at the beach, stopping to get a cold press, my moment to moment experience is gonna contain suffering. That's the first noble truth. All I've gotta do is say, oh, there you are. Oh, I see you, I see you. I can feel how genuine that is. I can hold you. It is okay that you're here. I am hardwired for compassion. This is my nature. This is the nature. It's the nature of my consciousness. It's the nature of your consciousness. So here's our invitation, the invitation that we've all offered each other by holding hands and sitting together and breathing together and walking together and studying together for 2,500 years in this tradition. Make our life into this. It's not complicated. Zen isn't complicated, it's so simple. We just make our whole life into one big teaching. For the wounding, we just see the wounding, we see the hurt, and we care for it, that's all. That's actually all, there is no Dharma beyond this. So I'm grateful, I'm grateful to be sitting with you, I'm grateful to be breathing with you, I'm grateful to be practicing with you, um, and I thank you again. I thank you for your attention this morning, I thank you for your zazen. Um, I thank you for the invitation to come back and sit with you. And um, I'll end my talk with that. And I'll offer you that bow. And um, I think I need to be reminded of what your schedule looks like. Do we chat for a while with questions and comments and stuff or if do we fly willing, away? If you're willing to put up with this, we generally have a few comments and questions for you. I am, I am more than willing to, to <laughs> so, oh dear. I'll invite the group here if anybody has any uh, questions that arose during the talk, any thoughts, comments. I'll, I'll dive in because I usually, you know, do sort of start out things here. Uh, but I think you just added a really interesting layer on a Dharma discussion that we had last week. There was much discussion, as we say. <laughs> we do love it, don't we? We do love it, yes. <laughs> but we had just chanted the verses on the faith mind, and we were looking at the first line, which is, you know, the way is not difficult, just avoid picking and choosing. And so, you know, we were discussing, you know, the idea of having an opinion about what's right and wrong which kind of ties in with what you said today about, I, I know what's best for you. Oh, um, yes. And you know, how that fits with what to do about the world and, and that sort of thing. And uh, uh, I think you've just added a really interesting uh, layer and elements to it. And you know, maybe it all just leads us, I think last week it led us to the point of, I don't know, but, uh, yeah I, I think it's i think it's interesting oh. endless endlessly so 
don't you think in our tradition especially mm -hmm. yeah yeah the um uh the uh, I, I I already forgot the name. I, I know that verse is translated like a thousand different ways. Faith, heart, mind, inscription is what I'm used to, but yeah. trust in mind or faith in mind or exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I I love that piece. Everybody loves that piece. You know, it's just it's so crazy and it's so Taoist. It's so Taoist. Oh my goodness, we can really feel our we can really feel our our uh, the voice of our Taoist mother in that and we can hear a little bit of the vo voice of our buddhist father i always think of zen as being kind of the kid i got my dad is buddhism and my mom is taoism and <laughs> i'm zen and you're like yeah that sounds about right but we really really hear we really hear the taoism in that and um i i appreciate i appreciate the value being put on don't know and i really appreciate the kind of implied um let's not be quite so certain that we know uh i experience that as freedom i really experience that as freedom but i also you know circumstantially have experienced that as tension because i think because of what i said there about you know, like um knowing being so powerfully equated with um certainty and intelligence and there's not only a social dimension to that like oh you you knew the answer oh you must be smart you therefore must be good you know oh you'd make a good mate <laughs> you'd make a good ceo oh you must have value as a person beyond that i'm uh, internally as a zazen practitioner i appreciate that certainty sometimes really attempts to take away the the tension of ambiguity you know when i land good person, bad person, good thing to do, bad thing to do. There's a certain kind of childlike simplicity to that, that the tension in me, that the insecurity in me, that the anxiety in me craves. It craves like, just tell me the thing. Just, ah. I, I'm guessing for all of us here today who are kind of experienced around Zen, we probably know some version of, come on, Zen. Ah, you're driving me nuts. Like, how come we can't just, how come we don't have a statement of things we believe? How come we don't have that? Religion's supposed to have that, isn't it? How come, how come we don't have a thing? Like, here's all the stuff we believe. How come we don't have that? How come we're so reluctant to give certain specific things? And I think it points to this relationship with our own suffering, actually, when we hold it closely. You know, how close can we get to that and, and trust we can act from a place of internal clarity that can't really be dictated from the outside in the form of... Well, rules and absolutes. Here's a behavior that's always helpful. Here's a behavior that's always hurtful. Here's a thing you should always say. Here's a thing you should never say. Uh, I'm with you. I, I love the I love the um, uh, faith, heart, mind inscription for that reason. But um, I, I have experienced it as being confounding for that, for the very same reason, just because there have been times in my life when I've really wanted. As, as fate would have it, it was the very first class the very first class I ever took um, from um, o Okumura Roshi, Shohaku Okumura. Some of you know that name. He's in our lineage. Right. Um, he's he's in a he's in a similar lineage. He's he's not in a Katagiri lineage, but um, he was the interim um, teacher at Minnesota Zen Center after Roshi died, and he was kind enough to kind of hold our sangha together during a time that was pretty rough because you know we lost our we lost our our abbot. Um, and so as fate would have it, the very first class I ever took at uh, Minnesota Zen Center was a class that um, Okamura Roshi was giving on faith, heart, mind, inscription. And folks, I did not understand one word of that class. I did not understand a word. I took copious notes, but I had absolutely no place to put that teaching. So that's why there's extensive discussion, right? Yeah. Um, so I want to open it up. Um, anybody have a question, something to say? I have a really informed thought. Okay. Do it. <laughs> hi, Michelle. I'm Tara. You and I. Hi. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hi, Tara. Hey, good to see you. <laughs> you're you're uh, the cool kid, the cool kid, the cool kid. No. <laughs> no. I know. 
I, 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 I really tried to put that. I really tried to put that on Tara, and she just flatly refused. I'm not okay. giving up. I'm not giving up, but she flatly refused it. I'll just say I just deny all labels, but definitely. <laughs> you are wise. Uh, I was thinking as you were talking, and thank you by the way. I really enjoyed your talk this morning. Um, how much I like the way some of the precepts are phrased. So, like, not to take up the way of anger. So it's like anger exists, right? Like we're human. I, I'm going to get mad. You know, I'm going to be judgy. I'm going to, you know, maybe even hate things. And I started to think like, am I always taking up a way of something? You know, is like. Yeah. Oh, you're freezing on me or I'm freezing on you or something. I lost you there, Tara. I'm getting an image, but I'm not getting sound. Oh, you're not getting sound. Oh, oh there, me? there. Now we're back. I'm sorry. I I floated off. I'm not sure how. Yeah, no worries. Can you hear me now? <laughs> I certainly can. And yes, not taking up the anger. Yeah. So I guess the last part of that thought is just I feel like if I'm taking up the way of anger, I'm choosing an experience over the ambiguity of not knowing, the discomfort of that. Like, and the uncertainty. A weapon. Yeah, a weapon, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love that wording. Um, and boy, am I with you, Tara. <laughs> I'm really with you on that. And what I appreciate, I mean, that's that's the cool thing about our tradition is, and, and I agree with you about the precepts. They are so, they're worded, regardless of the translation, because there's a bunch of different translations of our precepts, right? The invitation and the wording is always such that we're, we're encouraged or even required really to go deep enough into the spirit of each of them so that we understand this isn't just you know don't wear blue on thursdays it's not that kind of a it's not that kind of a tradition it's well wait wait what does i vow not to kill actually mean i've got to eat breakfast something's got to die what does that mean like what does nonviolence actually mean what is the way of anger what i love about the implication in that translation is um making a conscious choice and so I love your wording there, Tara. I can see why this is connecting with you or for you with what we talked about today, because in order for me to know what the way of anger is, I have got to be pretty intimate with, oh, that's what that feeling is that's arising in me. I know what that feeling is. I know where that comes from in me. And now I understand the impulse. That's the thing that makes me want to take up a weapon. I know what that, right? So all that implies conscious awareness of, and then a decision made from a place of clarity. I personally find I pick up anger and I'm living from anger when I don't know that I've just done that. Mm. Right, in other words, my agency is gone because I'm unconscious. It's when I go, oh wait, I am really, really angry right now. Oh my God, that means I'm suffering. Oh my God, that means part of me needs to be seen and understood and held. I get it, there's the conscious turning. It's usually like, oh, I've been throwing plates in the kitchen for a half an hour before I, I'm making that up, folks. <laughs> I'm trying to th think of an example of, you know, but it's, it's when you realize, oh, my God, I've been, I've been angry for 45 minutes. I've been mad ever since that phone call. Therefore, I have been acting from that place. I've been speaking from that place. My chest is constricted. Can you kind of feel it? So I love, Tara, what you said. The way of anger implies I have to at least understand and be self-aware enough to know when it arises in me and then to make a conscious choice not to act from that place. Is that what you're hearing too? Am I getting it right? I, I think you actually took it another layer deeper, which I think is pretty cool. It's like the observation of it and the acknowledgement of it is where the choice, like the seed of choice begins. Yes, for sure. Yeah, because if, if I refuse to be in relationship with it, then there's no awareness. Right, so like repression, suppression, denial, it's like, oh no, well then it's just still under there doing its thing, but I'm refusing to acknowledge it, therefore, yeah, it's always the autopilot that's the dangerous piece, yeah. Yeah, good catch, I like that. That's how you guys word your uh, precepts, the way of anger. Taking up the way of anger, isn't that right, Pam? Taking, Taking up. up the Yeah, mm -hmm. I vow to not take up the way of anger. Oh, I like that, that's very cool. Yeah. That's very, very cool. Yeah. Anyone else? Oh, we're all overcome by humidity, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, we're overcome by humidity. 
<laughs> anyway, we are so uh, happy and grateful that you return to give us another Dharma talk. Yeah. And we're very appreciative of the time that uh, you've given up to spend with us here. And uh, right, right back at you folks. Thank you. Have a beautiful, beautiful Sunday. I am grateful. I am grateful to be asked. I would, I'm always happy to do it. So it's beautiful okay. to spend time with you in this way. Thank you so much. You are very welcome. Now we're going to have a closing chant. And then despite the fact that we're grateful, we're going to go have tea and coffee without you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so that's how it is. Yeah, that's how it is. <laughs> You'll have to come visit sometime. I would love to do it. Thank you. All right. Thanks again. So many beings are numberless, bowing to carry them across. The many beings are numberless, bowing to carry them across. We anger and ignorance rise endlessly. Bowing to cut out the mind road. Greed, anger, and ignorance rise endlessly. Bowing to cut off the mind road. Dharma gates are countless. Bowing to wake to them all. Dharma gates are countless. Bowing to follow through. Buddha's way is all embracing. Bowing to follow through. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Uh, announcements. Um, Dushin McCabe is. Thank you. Hey, Ron. Hi, Ron. Hi, Ron. <laughs> What's the Dharma talk today, Ron? <laughs> uh, Daishin McCabe. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah Daishin McCabe is going to spend the next weekend with us. It'll be a Friday for uh, the moon ceremony, which we're resurrecting after a long time. And then we'll have Zazen Kai on Saturday, and he'll be here for our Dharma talk on Sunday. So looking forward to that. And anything else? All right, let's go converse. See you, Ron. See you, Ron. Bye, Ron. Bye, Ron. Bye, Ron.